ARLI, ARLI launched the Iran University in the fall of 2021 with the promise of offering an increasingly enriched educational experience to a wider audience of students. The ARU is excited to announce new courses on philosophy, li literature, business, and communication for its spring and summer uh, quarters that deliver on this promise. Today, we'll be joined by Harry Binswanger, Shoshana Milgram, and Don Watkins to discuss the value they expect their students to gain from these new courses. Welcome to New Idea Life. This is the podcast of the Ironwood Institute. I'm Zima with Gowan, I'm a junior fellow, and with me is Ben Bayer, fellow and director of uh, content. Hi, Ben. Hi, Zima with thanks. So before we get started today, I, I want to point out that everything we're doing today is here to promote these these new these new courses that we've added to our uh, our catalog, and we're doing it with the aim of trying to convince you to sign up for the courses. And so one thing I want to say is that all of the courses that we're going to be talking about today are open to auditors. Uh, some of them are still open to people who want to register as graded students, uh, and uh, that includes especially the courses by Dr. Harry Binswanger that we're going to be talking about uh, Dr. Binswanger's course doesn't start uh, for another couple of weeks, so there's still time to sign up as a graded scholarship student. Uh, but for all the courses today, you can still sign up as an auditor. And if you're interested in doing either of those things, signing up as an auditor or as a graded student with scholarship, uh, you can do that by going to university.einrand.org slash apply. And uh, I, so we'll, we'll come back to this same information at the end of the episode. Uh, to remind anyone who, whose interest is picked by what we discussed today. But yeah, Azimawit, so let's, let's talk a little generally about what the Ayn Rand University is to give people some background for the courses that we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, so generally speaking, AR courses feature lectures, graded assignments, uh, classroom discussions, and feedback. And, uh, and on top of that, ARU also offers a mentorship program. Uh, which helps our students in reaching their learning and career goals. And we already have some students who have found their jobs uh, with the help of our uh, co uh, coaches. And to give you some estimates, um, some general info, in the year 2022-2023, ARU total number of students is about 150 from all across the globe. So we have students from Europe, from Asia, from uh, from uh, uh, Australia, from Africa, from both uh, Americas. So now let's talk about ARU, ARU maybe a little bit specifically, more specifically, uh, its goals uh, and, and current courses, future uh, courses, and so on. So basically, ARU offer is for three groups, college age students, intellectual professionals, and professional intel, in, intellectuals and other people who do not belong to any of those categories uh, can sign up as uh, auditors. And so our students learn about Rand's uh, ideas, Rand's philosophy, but the focus is not only on theoretical knowledge, uh, but the application of philosophy to one's life. And so Ben, I'd like to start by asking you, what's your perspective on the overall goal of ARU, how do you think people can benefit from our courses, especially from their perspective? Maybe you could say a little bit about those three groups that I have uh, mentioned. Sure. Well, the first thing to say is to remind people that the overall goal of the Ayn Rand Institute, and this is part of our mission statement, is to educate the world about Ayn Rand's philosophy. And as most people know, we've we've found a variety of ways to do this over the years. We've had essay contests, we've had student clubs, we send speakers around the world, we have conferences, uh, we do podcasts like this one, and we, we write articles. But an increasing and I think dominant focus that we are now, uh, that we're now engaged in is education about objectivism in an intensive classroom style form. Of course, our classroom is not yet physical. It is a it is a virtual classroom. It's one that anyone in the world can can join. 
uh, through through Zoom and other other forms of media. And we're that's what, so the Ayn Rand University is is our virtual classroom and dedicated to this intensive style of of classroom style education. As you mentioned, Zimowit, there are a number of types of people we're especially looking for uh, to join our classroom. And, and here I'll speak from the perspective of someone who's involved in the admissions process. And so I'll give you an idea of what kind of criteria we use when we're deciding, when we're deciding whom to admit, especially as graded students. Uh, we aim to develop objectivist intellectuals, and that has uh, a number of different aspects to it. One aspect, I think the one that people are more familiar with is we're looking to develop and educate people who want to become professional intellectuals. This is, we're talking about people who want to professionally study, uh, write about, spread, educate people about objectivist ideas. Uh, these are academics, journalists, lawyers, uh, activists of different kinds. I think that's been our traditional focus, uh, the kind of people we traditionally want to educate in a classroom, but it's not our exclusive focus. So we also have a category we now think of as intellectual professionals as opposed to professional intellectuals. And these are people who maybe are not directly involved in educating others or spreading ideas to other people, but who still nonetheless crucially rely on philosophical ideas in their own work. Uh, and here you can think, for example, of business people, psychologists, scientists. I, and I wouldn't say it's restricted only to those, although those are the, the, the clear type of people we're, we're also looking uh, to to educate anyone who we see as someone who could potentially be a leader in objectivist community circles. And especially in relation to that, I think we see the other categories as, as categories of leaders as well. Especially in relation to that, that, that connects to something you mentioned, Zima, with about the, the importance of educating people, not just from the perspective of theoretical knowledge, uh, but knowledge that's aimed at being put into practice. Objectivism, after all, is a philosophy for living on earth. And so when we are looking to educate intellectual leaders, it's also therefore important that these be leaders who are willing to practice what they preach. That means they need to be upstanding moral role models. And so part, an increasingly important part of our education is aimed at this. We're uh, looking not just to teach people book knowledge, theoretical learning. We want to, we want to educate them uh, with knowledge that they can put into practice. And so in just about every course, when we're even when we're teaching ostensibly theoretical issues, we're emphasizing the practical dimension, the practical importance of these issues. We're talking about what facts and reality give rise to various concepts in Ayn Rand's philosophy so that we can understand how these concepts can be applied to reality. And uh, that's true, I think, even in the highly theoretical uh, philosophical courses, but especially true in the directly practically oriented courses. And we'll talk a little bit more about that today. Uh, one of the forms it's going to come up is when uh, Don Watkins talks about the coaching program. Yeah, but uh, our program offers more than just a courses on objectivism and, and philosophy. And so for, for example, there's a course on reading uh, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, which is going to be, which is already because it has started yesterday, I think, and it's led by Professor Shoshana Milgram, uh, with whom we're, we are going to talk uh, uh, later today. So tell, so tell me, Ben, uh, why do we offer such uh, courses? Well, the way that I think about this is that we, are being serious. We were being serious when we rebranded this program as the Ayn Rand University. And that's because we are we really are aiming to make our course offerings more in the mold of a kind of traditional liberal arts university focused on uh, science and humanities, uh, not just philosophy. And I think that goes hand in hand with the, the issue of bridging theory and practice, the kind of traditional goal of a liberal arts education was to, was to educate a, a well-rounded citizen or a well-rounded human being. And, and part of what being well-rounded there means, you're not just uh, learning theory, you're learning theory that has practical value in its applications. And uh, just to give you an example of the kind of thing I'm talking about here. So Zimo, you and I, we both got, we both just got done 
uh, with uh, helping to teach, helping Ankar Gatte to teach a course called Ayn Rand's Philosophy Through Her Fiction. And one of the things I found really valuable about it was that, well, many courses we've taught in the past uh, on objectivism usually focus on Ayn Rand's nonfiction and on the nonfiction writings of people like her student, uh, Dr. Leonard Peikoff, or his book, Objectivism and the Philosophy of Ayn Rand. Now, of course, these are, these are indispensable uh, sources for understanding Ayn Rand's philosophy, but it's also important that where the essence of her philosophy was first uh, formulated was was in her book, in her novel, At the Shrugged, and I think also importantly in, 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 in The Fountainhead and We the Living. And uh, this represents the fact that, I mean, this is the original source of her philosophy. It's where her philosophy was born and where it comes from. And and the fiction is a representative, is, is representative of, of, of ideas in action. It's watching people who are acting on ideas and, and seeing the consequences of those ideas. And it's it's also represented the fact that she got her ideas from observing people in reality and the consequences of the ideas that they act on. And so this is a point about Ayn Rand's philosophy, but I think it's a point about fiction more generally, that that the art of literature is is where you see philosophy in action. And there are many philosophic novels outside of Ayn Rand's philosophic novels. I take it that uh, Crime and Punishment is is one of these. Uh, Dr. Milgram will tell us more about this, I think, but it's it's a it's a demonstration of what it looks like for a, a very different philosophy to be put into action and the, its consequences. And we'll 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 talk more about that today. But uh, I think this goes along with the fact that we're educating people f about the practical impact of philosophy, and incidentally, not just objectivist philosophy, but other philosophies, because part of what we do in the Ayn Rand University is to compare objectivism to other philosophies so that they get a better understanding of what that philosophy means and how it applies in action. Yeah, so you, so you emphasize that it's a university. And so the natural question that comes to mind, and I think a lot of people are, especially young people who are in jurists who are thinking about signing up for our uh, courses are thinking, what is the difference between ARU and a college? or between ARU and obtaining a degree, either a bachelor's degree or a master's? I'll just answer this one pretty briefly. I mean, I, what I said before was that we're trying to make it more like uh, a traditional liberal arts curriculum. That doesn't mean we're actually make it in, making it into one, at least not yet. The, the biggest difference I would say is, is we're not accredited. So uh, no one's, you're not going to be able to get a degree that, that people will recognize uh, for professional purposes. But uh, we still are thinking of it as an incredibly important alternative because, I mean, just as the most the most obvious point is there are no university programs today where you can, at least to any great extent, study objectivist philosophy or study uh, literature and science through the perspective of objectivist philosophy. That's what we are looking to offer uh, through the Ayn Rand University. It's not it's not a replacement for a traditional uh, bachelor's degree, but it is, I think, an important supplement. And I should also just mention, uh, somewhat in passing, for what it's worth, training in the Ayn Rand University is, at least from our perspective, a major prerequisite for being able to become increasingly involved in a professional capacity in our program. So if you want to speak at Ocon, or if you want to write for New Ideal, the, all of the people, or most of the people who, who do that for us today are people who've gone through our training programs in the past. We'll talk more about that a little later today. Uh, the Ayn Rand University is now our premier intellectual training program. Okay, uh, so maybe now it's the time to welcome uh, our first guest. Uh, Dr. Milgram uh, is an associate professor of English at Virginia Tech. She specializes in, nar in narrative fiction and film. She has lectured on Ayn Rand at Objectivist and Academic Conferences, and she has published on Rand, Ego, and Dostoevsky, among uh, others. Dr. Dr. M Milgram, welcome. Hi. So um, my first question to you, uh, doctor, is, so I've read Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment when I was about 15 and 16, and I loved it. Uh, I think I reread it when I was a little bit uh, older. My question to you is, what, what would you say is significant about that book? 
Uh, and why did you want to offer a course uh, which analyzes this book for our students? Okay, well, that's, that's two questions. And one is what's significant about it. And significant, well, that depends on you know, to whom and for what, as, as with all values. I think that uh, what especially marks crime and punishment is that it is great art. And yet, unlike the art of Ayn Rand's, it does not serve, I think, as a philosophical or existential model for anyone. I don't think anyone who reads Crime and Punishment wants to go out and be Raskolnikov. Even Raskolnikov as he is in the epilogue, all right? So it is, it is definitely not a how-to book. However, the experience of reading the book is something that I think is very valuable because it really does fit into what Ayn Rand says we get from art, that art stylizes and conditions man's consciousness. And if you read this book, that you read it carefully and you read it with attention, that will happen to you. You don't come out of that book the same size you went in. And uh, a mind with Dostoevsky in it is never going to be as empty as a mind without. So it's, it's a really valuable experience because we're dealing with a master artist. Dostoevsky, this was not his first novel. It's his first great novel. Some of us think that it's the best book he ever wrote. From the standpoint of the, the stature and the scale and the intensity and the integration of the storyline with the characters and with his purpose. And um, in saying that, I, I guess I, I think that his book itself is a big argument for reading it, but it's not something that you can necessarily guess just from a one sentence summary, which is why I'm really happy that we have eight weeks in order to study it. Now, one of the reasons I especially like the idea of doing it in this setting is that he wrote it in 12 installments. In other words, he wrote it so that people would read it and have time in between. And he even was not even done writing it when the first installment appeared. And we're not doing it in 12 weeks, but we are doing it in eight weeks. And I think that this is a novel that especially benefits from being read carefully and with, intent, with attention and in pieces. I also think that it grows on you, you know, as you, you, you read a week and then you think about it and then you read some more. And by the end, I think we will have been through Raskolnikov's experience and Dostoevsky's experience and, of course, our own experience. It is a course that I intend to make and I have, I uh, make it active. I mean, right now I'm talking all by myself, but in the class, I, that is not the way I want to, to do class and not, in fact, the way that I, I did it yesterday. The students need to bring their own questions and concerns to the course because I, let's just say I've read this book many times, but some of the students have read it when they were 15 or 16 like you, and some are reading it for the first time. And the course is for everybody because even for people who've read it before, uh, you're, the, you're not the same person in all respects, so you may have different questions. And given that your mind is working with the material, that's part of what we want to do together. Now, I'll say one more thing because you asked about our students, you know, the, um, the ARU students. It's a real gift for me to be able to study this novel with people who are familiar with Ayn Rand's fiction. And one of the reasons is that it's not Ayn Rand's fiction. Because you might read, uh, like, the fiction of Victor Hugo was the one she felt closest to, you know, from a sense of life perspective. That's not true for Dostoevsky. And so, and it's not true for many other writers you might like. I know that some of people who are familiar with Ayn Rand's fiction, everything else looks sick after that, inadequate. You know, it looks like lesser Ayn Rand. Well, I don't think you'll have that sense when you read Dostoevsky because he's in, he's writing from his own universe, his own art. And so it's lesser Ayn Rand and an alternative to Ayn Rand. However, it is one for which Ayn Rand's art and her ideas can serve as a foil. And actually, that's part of our course. I have uh, some of the assignments to ask students to bring in something there, because all the ARE students are familiar with Ayn Rand's work, to bring in something from her work that is related, parallel, or contrasting with something we read together. And of course, it could be that there's an Ayn Rand villain who is, who is uh, parallel in some respect to Dostoevsky's protagonist but that's part of what we expect. I think that's interesting. And so uh, I like the idea of being able to depend on that. 
Now, I sometimes do teach Ayn Rand in my regular courses at the university, and even um, I've, I've taught Ayn Rand in connection with, with Raskolnikov, Crime and Punishment, but I haven't been able to depend on the full information and background that I can here, which I think is going to be uh, valuable and, and fun for us. Sure. Dr. Milgram, uh, I wanted to follow up a little on what you just mentioned about Dostoevsky's universe. I, I, yeah. I also read Crime and Punishment in high school and was greatly impressed by it. I think it was the first work of literature I was ever impressed by as a work of art. I had not yet uh, read any Ayn Rand. And uh -huh. one of the things that I was struck by was just how philosophical it was. It was in many ways a commentary on the the dominant philosophies of the period, whether we're talking about utilitarianism or radical atheist socialism or the various proto Nietzschean views. How much of Dostoevsky's own philosophy do you plan to explore in this course? Okay. All right. Well, I'm glad you asked that because it's a question that people sometimes do ask about Dostoevsky. To what extent is he expressing his own ideas? And so I'm really glad to have the chance to say that you should not expect that a character is expressing his own ideas. Okay? Because any more than in Ayn Rand's, sometimes the character is speaking for her, sometimes not. And spoiler alert, Dostoevsky never murdered a single person. So it can't quite be that Raskolnikov and his ideas are meant to be an expression of Dostoevsky's own ideas. And as you probably know, I think Ayn Rand made the point, uh, he had enormous trouble creating a positively good character. Ayn Rand did not have trouble with that. I mean, she certainly you know, worked her way up to the ideal man, and we've, we've got him in the fountainhead, and from then on, Dostoevsky, that remained a challenge for him. However, he's very good with characters, and he is certainly good with having ideas be on the table in the course of the fiction that he writes. Now, I, I just actually read a reasonably fairly new book by Kevin Birmingham, and he comments in that book, and I agree with this, he said, this is not a book about ideas as such, it's a book about the trouble with ideas. Okay, the, the way that uh, a character might work through ideas and in a way that is not necessarily promoting a good life. So I think it's certainly true that we can criticize ideas that we see at work and we see them explored. We see them spoken by characters. But it's, I don't think it's reasonable, especially with crime and punishment, to say that we can point to this character as expressing what Dostoevsky said, especially since spoiler alert, some of the characters with whom Dostoevsky is most supportive are the ones who have the least to say. Okay, so uh, now you mentioned the 1860s, in, or I think you meant the 1860s in Russia, and this is indeed set right in his own time, and there were ideas, so to speak, in the air. And these ideas do come up in the novel because, well, people talk about ideas. There's a very negative character who is trying to learn all the new ideas. So you see what those new ideas are. And Raskolnikov, our protagonist himself, has actually just written an article explaining his ideas. Now, the article itself does not appear in the book, but it is discussed in, I guess it's part three, chapter five, and you find out about that. So it certainly is a book in which uh, people are thinking and are considering ideas and abstract ideas and the question you raised of the application of those ideas to human lives. So I think you could certainly say that ideas are affirmed, disputed, repudiated, denied, explored, considered in the course of crime and punishment because ideas are important. But that's not the same thing as saying that you can read this book and take out an idea and say, okay, that's what I learned from it. Well, you know, with, with Ayn Rand, I think you can do that. And with a, certainly with Ayn Rand, it's reasonably possible. It's quite possible, actually. You know, the more, the more that you know them and the more careful you are to say, okay, here is someone speaking for Ayn Rand, and this is how I know it. With Crime and Punishment, it's different. And I'll tell you one more thing, because I think it's part of why this course is so much fun for me. We start out with an action without the motivation for the action being crystal clear. 
And so it's sometimes said, it's not original with me, that this is not a who done it, it's a why done it. So, and it's going to take us a while to find out. Uh, and well, if you don't care about why, then it's not the book for you. But if you care about why, then it's very interesting. You might remember in, in, in Ayn Rand's fiction, people are, you know, why are you asking, always asking why? You know, James Taggart says to Cheryl, and that makes him a bad guy, it makes her good for always asking why. Or when um, the, the wet nurse uh, says, says to her, why are you asking why? It's good to ask why. And when you read Crime and Punishment, we are asking why, because that's important. And it's not going to be just whatever or who cares, because Dostoevsky, this novel, cares very much about the whys. Well, thank you for that. Was there anything else you wanted to say about the course uh, for anyone out there who's, who's thinking about signing up? Uh, I guess as an auditor at this point, because the course did just start, so the first class has happened, but it's not too late to uh, catch up. Okay, well, I guess I'm, I'm going to show you the book that I like to use. This is a brand, relatively new book for years. This is the best one. It has, it's available in Kindle for those who are far from bookstores. It's got some essays that we're going to be, collateral materials we're going to be looking at together. So if, uh, I mean, I've taught the Jesse Colson translation. I've taught the Pavir and Balakonsky translation. I think this one's better. Of course, if you can read it in Russian, that's cool too. But um, I, I like this. It's got a map. So you can do your own Raskolnikov tour of St. Petersburg, and which Dostoevsky does. You know, he's, he's showing you where the character goes. And that's the, the concrete reality of that is part of his experience. So, you know, it's, it's art. And art is an experience as opposed to just a container for an idea that you can extract. You need... It's, it's an entire experience, and in our time together, I hope that we will have that. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Doctor. Um, so before Ben, we before we move on, uh, I would like to. We've got two super chat comments, I guess. One is from Gail. Gail says, "Keep keep it up," and Catherine, who says, "Congratulations on these new uh, courses. Thank you guys very much." Um, so before we invite our next guest, uh, let's get back to uh, and talk a little bit more about ARU, about maybe specific courses. Ben, you're an instructor. You've been teaching uh, objectivism in objectivism seminar, but also in the aforementioned objectivism through Ayn Rand's fiction. C could you tell something about the courses and about your experience uh, maybe also from the perspective of the dynamics, the relations between our students and you? Well, let me pick up on the last thing you asked about first, uh, so that I don't forget about, about it, because um, it's important. And a lot of people will ask, why take courses through a platform like the Iron Man University when I can read these books on my own, and even listen to an endless series of uh, lectures that we offer for free through our platform. Uh, and that's a, is a good question. I think for many people, depending upon your priorities, that may well be a fine thing to do. But there is one important thing, and it's, I think, a lot of people underrate it, that you can get from a live class. And that's, that's yeah. feedback and interaction. And that's something that's available in one form or another, whether you're a graded student or you're a, an auditor. The graded students, of course, do homework and, it's, and they receive feedback from instructors. And so get, having to do some kind of assignment on your reading is a way of processing that reading. It's a way of testing your own understanding of that reading, seeing if you can apply it in the way that is consistent with the, the meaning that's conveyed in the texts. And to, you know, to actually get feedback from people who've been studying these ideas for years, if not decades, is an invaluable experience. I should say even the auditors who are not being graded are still able to get meaningful interactive feedback because auditors can still come to class, they can still ask questions in class, they can still attend office hours and ask questions there. 
And so uh, there are there have even been in the past there have been uh, there have been auditors who will still do the homework on their own, uh, just just for the sake of uh, the educational purpose of it. They we don't have the resources to grade all of the homeworks the auditors do, but uh, they'll do it on their own. Sometimes they'll meet together to discuss it on their own what they think the answers uh, the best answers are. So the main the main thing to say about the experience of an Ayn Rand University course is the very meaningful uh, interactive feedback that you're going to get that you won't get uh, if you are just listening to lectures on your own. And one thing I'll also say is that you know, when you are committed by signing up for a course, and if you're an auditor paying for it, is well, you've you've invested in it now, and you're you're giving yourself an incentive to keep on a study schedule. Uh, that, that's that's a value, I think, both for the auditors and for uh, the graded students. But you also asked about the content of some of these courses. And we discussed the Ayn Rand's philosophy through her fiction course already. I'll say one more thing about the seminar course that you also mentioned, which you and I have both been involved in. And currently, we're in our second year of that seminar. Uh, we had the first year last year. The first year is the foundations course, where we talk about foundational issues in metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics. The second year is what we call the normative applications uh, chapter of the course. We talk about applied issues in epistemology, ethics, and, and uh, politics, even, even a little bit of aesthetics. What's true about both years of this course is it's an in-depth exploration of objectivist philosophy through primary sources, through primary texts, Ayn Rand's own essays, her own nonfiction essays, and, and also chapters from Dr. Leonard Peikoff's Objectivism through the philosophy, Objectivism and the Philosophy of Ayn Rand. Uh, and with one additional twist, which is very often, whenever we can, we ask students to study these texts and to study these objectivist ideas by then also reading non-objectivist philosophers who are commenting on similar questions in philosophy. And then we ask the students to, to think about how they would compare and contrast these philosophic views. Sometimes it's philosophers who are arguing for a, a similar perspective, but in a very different way, as when we, for example, will read, uh, say, from Aristotle. But also we have philosophers who are arguing for just a completely opposed perspective. And uh, there's a lot to learn about how objectivism differs, compares and contrasts. And, and we, we're also not doing it just for the sake of uh, uh, being able to debunk everything that all of these other philosophers say. Sometimes there are important lessons to learn from these historical philosophers. There are problems that they've identified, and uh, there's a solution that's needed. And sometimes they don't give the right solution, but it's important to understand just what that, that historical problem in philosophy is in order that we can appreciate better what objectivism's solution to it is. So it sounds like a lot. <laughs> so my follow-up question is, are ARU courses difficult? Are they demanding? I think they, I think they are. And I think that's a, a feature, not a bug. Uh, doing something challenging and demanding is, is the best. When, when you're talking about learning philosophy, doing it in a demanding and challenging way is the indispensable way to actually do it with understanding, to actually develop an understanding of a complex system of ideas to see how it applies to the world. And so, yes, it's, it's demanding and challenging. And I think uh, it's, it's a good challenge to have if that's the goal that you're, that you're looking for. And of course, it means that you then have to budget your time. I think that there are people who budget more and less time, depending on where they are in life and what they have time for. Uh, so it's, it, it can be as demanding and challenging as you want it to be, depending on how much time you can afford to put into it. Okay, I have one last question before we invite our next guest. Um, ARU it didn't come just out of thin air. It has its predecessors, uh, predecessors Objectivist Academic Center, uh, of which I did three years, and Objectivist Graduate uh, Center. And you were one of the instructors of OEC. Could you tell us a little bit about those two programs? Sure. So 
the Objectivist Academic Center was the name we gave to our core educational program as recently as I think two years ago. And it was what is now the, the basically the core philosophy and communication programs of what's now the Ayn Rand University. And so ARU is what's grown from that to include more courses on uh, practical issues, more courses on the humanities and the sciences, more courses on non-objectivist philosophy. So it's, uh, the, the, the OAC was the core. And, and one thing I'll say just from my experience as an instructor in the OAC, it was one of the first things that I did when I came on board at ARI about five years ago. And just one anecdote I'd like to share with people about this is when I started at the Institute, I had been studying both philosophy and objectivism for uh, over 20 years. And so, and, and I had a, a, you know, I'd done graduate school in philosophy and I'd been a college professor teaching philosophy. And so, you know, I, I knew a fair amount. Um, and when I was hired, uh, one of the first jobs was to basically serve as a teaching assistant for Ankar Gatte's seminar courses on objectivism. And all I can say is, even though I was there to assist in the teaching, I learned quite a lot uh, about objectivism from Ankar. And I was impressed by how much there was to learn, even you know, as someone who'd been studying it for 20 years professionally, uh, how many different interconnections there were that I had never noticed before that Ankar was able to see and the kind of historical perspective that he brought to the teaching of objectivism, I found really, uh, really impressive. And so that's just someone from coming from this long history of studying philosophy and objectivism, still being able to get something from it. So if I could get something from it, I think a lot of people out there will as well. You also mentioned the Objectivist Graduate Center. Now this was, this was the Ironman Institute's first higher education program that was founded, I believe, in the late 1980s, early 1990s. It was at times live instruction in classrooms in New York and in Southern California. Eventually later, it was then on the phone. Uh, I myself was educated under the auspices of the Objectivist Graduate Center in the late 90s. And if you look at the offerings that ARI has today, whether on our podcasts, our conferences like OCON, and of course, the Ayn Rand University itself, most of the teachers and lecturers and instructors and writers that we use uh, who are more senior are people who were educated uh, under the auspices of the Objectivist Graduate Center. So it was the, it was the, where all of this comes from, in effect. And, and one point I will mention by way of segueing to our next topic is that uh, the teacher who I learned the most from when I was in the Objectivist Graduate Center from you know, between 1998 and 2006 uh, was Dr. Harry Binswanger, who uh, taught a whole series of seminars on uh, on objectivism, on objectivist epistemology, on objectivist ethics. Uh, I was taking these courses all the while I was in graduate school. So for me, it was an indispensable supplement to what I was learning there. Uh, you know, at times I had to do kind of double entry bookkeeping to remember, well, here's what I'm learning about objectivism, which I regard as a, as, as a rational philosophy. Here's something I'm learning about all these other philosophies. It gave me all kinds of insight and ideas for how to think about and process what I was learning in graduate school. Uh, gave me all kinds of ideas for projects to write about and ultimately my dissertation. So uh, I, I owe a lot to Dr. Ben Swanger. And so it's, it's fortunate we get to talk with him today. Yeah, and we're very excited that ARU has two new courses to uh, offer, and both are led by Dr. Bin Swanger, who's uh, one of the greatest uh, experts, really, in uh, objectivism. So for those who don't know Dr. Bin Swanger, he has a PhD in philosophy. Uh, he's a member of the Iron Institute's board, uh, board of uh, Directors. Uh, he was an associate and friend of uh, Ayn Rand in her later years. Uh, he's also the author of How We Know, among uh, others. Welcome, uh, Doctor. Thank you, Zim Ruet. I'm uh, happy so to doctor, be able I... to talk about the courses. Yeah, I'm very happy to have you here. So uh, I have um, a few questions for you. So you will be teaching two courses in, a qu in quarter three and quarter four, Objectivist Logic, 
and a course of systematic study of uh, Rand's introduction to objectivist epistemology. Could you say a few words about the first course, objectivist logic? So my first question is, why is it objectivist and not just logic? And also a follow-up question to that is, what is the difference between this course that you are offering, that you are leading, and a typical course on formal logic that you get at university? Well, that's really the same question, because what objectivist logic, what I'm referring to by that is not some other alternative logic contradictory to Aristotelian logic, traditional logic. It's an expansion. It's Ayn Rand's contribution to the science of logic. I used to teach introductory logic at Hunter College in New York City, and I also taught it at Hofstra University on Long Island. And I began by teaching traditional logic, but I found that it really was not too helpful. The errors that the students were making and the kind of positive work they needed to do had nothing to do with the topics of the traditional logical syllabus, which involves, for instance, the syllogism. And you study 256 different forms of syllogism and the rules that you can use to test them for validity. Well, it turns out people only use two. Only use two of 256 uh, syllogisms that are logically possible. And the mistakes they make are only two. Sure, there are other mistakes that in principle you could make, but th those are not the mistakes that people do make. And meanwhile, as I worked with and uh, studied and discussed and taught objectivism, I could see that there was so much rich content in what Ayn Rand was teaching us that was actually logic, such as the fallacies that she identified, the fallacy of the stolen concept. My God, how powerful is that when you're reading the history of philosophy? The fallacy of self-exclusion and uh, the fallacy of context dropping. She said one in one article, uh, that context dropping is the major tool of evasion. That was a surprise to me when I read it, but it can be entirely innocent also. The way that objectivism talks about hierarchy as well as context is so much far advanced over what Aristotle did for his first steps. Aristotle is one of the few philosophers that did grasp the hierarchy, that there is a hierarchy of knowledge, but he's the beginning steps and Ayn Rand is hierarchy with a vengeance and integration with a vengeance and definition with a vengeance. So we spend a lot of time on the theory of definition, the rules of proper definition, exercises in definition. I give terms that the students have to define. And they're not, you know, highfalutin philosophical terms, but I start them out with simple terms like telephone or prize or chuckle or explosion. Those are the ones I remember teaching in the OGC in the mid 90s. And it's very interesting to learn how to do the method of definition, because that's really the method of all thinking. It's differentiation and integration, checking against perception and uh, integrating beyond your narrow sphere into the total context of your knowledge. So objectivism teaches you how to really think efficiently, successfully in the real world. And this course, uh, the objectivist logic course, 
is devoted to giving you the tools that will improve your thinking. And I know the people who took the course when I gave it in 95, 96, tell me that it did help their thinking. So uh, it's my, it's a different universe than what you would study and what I taught at the beginning under symbolic logic, uh, not symbolic logic, traditional logic. Symbolic logic is not particularly valid. It's, I mean, it's, it's not invalid, but it's not a tool of cognition. It's a game. I think that's enough on that topic. Uh, can, can, uh, hi there. So I'm back on screen. Yes, Harry, I wanted hi, to ask hi, you man. two follow up questions. Um, one about that course and then one about the other. And uh, the first is just, I, I remember that you sometime in the last five years taught a course on logic at uh, our summer. And I suspect some people in our audience might have taken that. And so if they're thinking about perhaps signing up for this one, can you say, more about how it differs and what I, I mean, one yeah. thing has got to be longer. So you're probably adding more, but maybe you'll, maybe you can say yeah. more. Yeah. Uh, if you're thinking of taking this course, you should, it's going to be a great course. You're going to be very happy. You took it. You're going to get great training. There was no training in the courses I taught. They were from my book and they were, uh, they covered, some of the same material that this course will cover, but it did not have homework assignments, class discussion, chewing. So it, the, the courses that I gave at Ocon, which I think are terrific, uh, are like trailers to the actual movie. So it, it's not just longer, it's more, devoted to helping you apply these tools in your own thinking and getting feedback on where you're doing it right and where you're doing it wrong. Great. So here's the question about the other one. Now, the other one is a higher level course on Ayn Rand's book, Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology. Uh, graded students can still sign up for it, but if you're a graded student, because it's higher level, you, there's some prerequisites you'll have to have taken. Maybe we can still convince you to, to, to sign up for it. But auditors are still available, uh, are able to take it. And so if there are auditors out there thinking about this, I think maybe, Harry, the best thing you can tell them about is just what is so important about this book that it warrants a whole class on its own? What does Ayn Rand do in that book? And then what are you going to help people see about it? She validates reason. She shows why reason, which we know is valid. She shows why it's valid, how it operates, how it relates to our contact with the reality, which is sense perception. This is something that no philosopher, including Aristotle, was ever able to do. So you've heard of her theory of measurement emission, and that is her solution to the problem of universals. Now, let me just give you a little advertisement for this, why this, why this is important. One of the other great achievements of Ayn Rand in philosophy is the proof of the objectivist ethics. People were convinced by people, I mean philosophers and the man on the street both, but philosophers were teaching this as fact that reason cannot produce an ethics, that questions of values are different from question of facts and there's no way to use logic to derive morality from scientific knowledge about reality. And one of her great achievements was she showed how to derive ought from is, ought, O-U-G-H-T, the good from what is fact. So what did she do to derive it? She traced back a conceptual hierarchy. She reduced the concept value back 
to the perceptual level facts that gives rise to the concept. She didn't try to deduce ethics from something else. She showed how we derive the concept of value from perception of reality. And that perception is a biological fact. So her method of basing concepts on lower level concepts in a hierarchy and all of it redu reduced down to perception was how she got to her ethics. And it explains why no one else ever did. So if you admire her ability to prove her ethics, you have to admire the theory and practice of ITOE, as we call it, Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, because that's what she did. Um, so, Doctor, could you tell us a little bit what students can expect from the course on reading ITOE, uh, what they can expect that they can get uh, that they wouldn't get just from reading the book on their own? Well, I teach students to get in and wrestle with the text. I teach them to ask certain questions of the text. I'll give you an example. Um, this is one that is semi-random, but it will illustrate what's going on. So you're reading along, in, and you get to chapter six, axiomatic concepts. Uh, I guess I'll screen this way. And you get to this bottom paragraph, existence, identity, and consciousness are concepts in that they require identification in conceptual form. Their peculiarity lies in the fact that, and this is in italics, they are perceived or experienced directly, but grasped conceptually. Now you're reading on, you say, yeah, I get that. They, they are perceived directly. I perceive that there's stuff out there. I perceive that I'm conscious. I perceive that the stuff that's out there, like this is a mat knife and it is different from this object here, a vaping thing. I get that. And then you go on. They are implicit in every, but no, you haven't gotten the point. What is, why is it in italics and how is it different from the concept table? That's what I will ask you in class. Isn't table perceived or experienced directly, but grasped conceptually? And what is the but doing there? Why isn't it they are perceived or experienced directly and grasped conceptually? So uh, I think the you, you have to know how to get in and ask questions of the text because it's a really important point that you will get when you understand why she says that's their peculiar, peculiarity. I have trouble with that word. And the thing is filled with sentences like that, that you, you, if you read it alone, you tend to say, yeah, uh-huh, that sounds right. Okay, uh-huh. And even if you challenge yourself to say, what's an example of that? You don't know if you've got a good example or if you've got enough examples or what you're contrasting it with. So there's a whole method of confronting the text that I teach that is the only way to appreciate a, the content that's there, and B, the genius of Ayn Rand who can put that content in in a way that makes you say, yeah, yeah. When actually, if you try to present it in your own words, it would probably be, what? You know, it's very hard to write philosophic prose let alone to write it in a way that makes it just seem, yeah, yeah, that's right, of course. So there's no way you can get, you know, unless you've been a, in a lot of graduate classes in philosophy, graduate, 
classes in philosophy, taught by a good teacher, all of whom are dead today, by the way. No, that's an exaggeration. Who can show you how to ask questions of the text and get an objective answer. There's no way you're going to really mind mine the gems and gold that's in this book. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, for everyone, Objectivist Logic course starts on April 17th and ITOE course, that is, uh, again, the course on reading introduction to Objectivist uh, epistemology, uh, epistemology starts on April uh, 20th. And so make sure to sign up. I'm signing up for Objectivist Logic. Uh, Dr. Binsmanger, thank you so much for being here with us uh, today. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Um, ben, I think there's one question, uh, super chat question from Utterant of Lady Columbia. Uh, thank you for that question. So the question is, so, so this person is asking, uh, they are new to uh, objectivism and, and generally to philosophy. And so they are asking, what could we recommend uh, as a solid foundation to start? Sure. So one thing I'll say as a preface is just, it's hard to know exactly what to recommend without knowing more about who you are and what your interests are. And one thing that we've started to do more with our program, and I think Don will be able to speak to this more shortly, is we've tried to encourage people to take an individualized approach. And so if you sign up as a graded student, you'll receive coaching and your coaches will help you decide what are the most important courses for you to take, given what you would like to do with your knowledge. And so uh, if, if you're thinking about signing up uh, right now, I would say hold on until you find out what your coaches say before you, before you decide. However, you might be thinking of just auditing and... Uh, you can always ask yourself, you can always ask, of course, us uh, very briefly, like, what do you think, given these interests, would be the best course for me to take? But leaving that possibility aside, I will just say, if I had to pick something that I think most people would profit from beginning with, it would be the Ayn Rand's Philosophy Through Her Fiction course, uh, which we designed as an introductory beginner's course. Because first, because, as I mentioned before, I think this is where this is the home of her philosophy, is her, her fictional portrayal of it. It's also the reading that I think most people are familiar with. If they know Ayn Rand, they've already done some of the reading from her, her fiction. And what we'll be doing is going back and looking at really key scenes to understand key concepts of her philosophy and how they are illustrated and dramatized there. Uh, so that, I think, is the best place to start. Now, unfortunately, we're not offering that course, I think, again, until next fall. Uh, and so if you're asking about a course to take as soon as quarter three uh, to begin, that's a little harder for me to say. Uh, the, the, we've talked about, I think, most of the new courses that are starting today, uh, that are starting this quarter in our discussion today. And you know, something like, something like uh, Dr. Binswanger's logic course is, is available at a 100 level for people who are beginners. And so that's that's one possibility. Yeah, another possibility I think we'll talk about later on, uh, it will be reading groups. So something for people who are not yet ready for for ARU or they don't want, don't want yet to commit themselves to our full uh, courses, but uh, we'll talk about that later on. We have another um, super chat, which is heart emoji from Bunny. Bunny, thank you. A lot. Uh, so before we ask our we sorry before we invite our last guest, uh, let me ask you Ben another question. So in in her essay for the new intellectual, Rand argues that what our culture needs, uh, what we need is new intellectuals. Quote: Any man or woman who is willing to think, a man or woman who is guided by his intellect not a zombie guided by his by feelings instincts urges wishes whims or revelations and so my question to you ben is 
could you say a little bit about how your helps in creating the new intellectual or the new intellectuals? So there's so much to say in response to this question. And in a way, I think we've been talking about it all along today. So all of the things we've been talking today are about how we create new intellectuals. But I will uh, just by way of giving, a, I think, an illustrative example, mention one thing that I think is particularly valuable here, because b being an intellectual is, as I've stressed, not just being somebody who n knows a lot of book knowledge. Uh, it, it also means someone who's willing to use this knowledge, use these ideas in practice. And if you are thinking about becoming a professional intellectual, the practice of being a, an intellectual is not just knowing things, but trying to communicate the, your knowledge to other people, trying to teach other people, trying to persuade other people. And I've stressed throughout that there's a there's an important practical dimension to the training that we offer at the ARU. One example of this is that we actually have courses on communication so that people can co develop their communication skills. These courses involve constant and regular feedback on both written and spoken work that students are assigned to do. And just to really drive this point home, you know what they say about how do you get to uh, to, <laughs> to perform in Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. Well, Ocon uh, is kind of the Carnegie Hall of objectivism. And the answer there, how do you get to speak at Ocon, is the same. Practice, practice, practice. And here, I'll just mention that that all of our current younger intellectuals and speakers and teachers, and here I include myself, have to do exactly this. If we, if we want, to, under the auspices of the Ayn Rand University, if we want to be able to perform, as it were, at, at Ocon and at other, conference, other conferences that we offer, we give regular practice versions of the, of the courses or talks that we're offering at these conferences. Uh, I just did this a few weeks ago, uh, where we get direct immediate feedback from people like your own Brooke Ankar Gatte and Harry Binswanger. They, they tear us apart. They, they, they focus on you know, what we're not doing right with regard to the formulation of our subject, our theme, motivation, organization, concretization, delivery, everything. And then we do it again, and then we do it again. And, and this is how we get better. This is how we are able to hone our knowledge and apply it to real live uh, communication. And so uh, this is something that I think our next guest is going to be able to say more about, both because he's involved in the coaching pro uh, program, but also because he's teaching a course on communication. And that's uh, Don Watkins, of course. Yeah, Don Watkins is our next guest. He's director of coaching and mentoring at uh, ARU. He's the author, co-author uh, co of best-selling books, such as Equal is uh, Unfair or Free Market Revolution that he wrote with uh, Jerome Brook. He also wrote uh, a novel, I Am Justice, which is a, thrill, a thriller. Welcome, Don. Hey, good to be here. Uh, yeah, great to have you here. So, Don, apart from the courses uh, that you help teach at ARU that we'll talk about, uh, what is your overall role in uh, ARU? So, when we were deciding, and by we, I mean, uh, Tal and the team. I wasn't. Uh, I had left ARI for a while, but I was brought into a planning meeting, and there was a decision about like what, how are we going to take what we're doing the OAC and take it to the next level. One of the things that became really clear is that one of the most important values that you can get from an education or an aspect of what can really supercharge an education is personalization. And certainly, my experience. You know, I I went through the OAC, but. So much of what I learned came from the fact that I worked at ARI and I got to develop personal relationships and get really individualized feedback from people like Ankar Gatte and your book and Alex Epstein, who then worked at ARI. And the question is, well, we don't have the capacity to have like on tutoring every single ARU student. And so what we came up with was a coaching model where each student is paired with a coach that they're working one on one with to succeed in the program and then to use what they're learning in their life. And in particular, in their 
in their pursuit of a meaningful career. And so my main job is to help create that program. And then as a coach, I work with the students, but mostly I work with our more advanced students. So I work with you, Zimowit, um, the people who are starting their actual careers as intellectuals and bring that kind of personalized attention to help people with their development, help them um, really make objectivism their own. And then for those who want to become intellectuals, build their career on that basis. Got it. So uh, Don, you are teaching two courses uh, this coming quarter. And I should mention, by the way, we're on a quarter system where we are basically teaching throughout the year and there are weeks in between each quarter quarter, but this means we run into the summer. So if you're, if you're a student who's not taking regular classes during the summer, ARU is a great opportunity. And so one of the courses you're teaching is called Philosophy, Work, and Business. This sounds to me like one of those courses I've been referencing that's really aimed at the practical value of philosophical ideas, especially in application to the business world. Uh, tell us more about what you're going to discuss in this, in this course. What kind of topics are you going to cover? And uh, how will students get a chance to apply it? Sure. Well, just one quick correction. So the persuasion mastery course has been moved to quarter four. Um, ah. And uh, so plenty of time to sign up for that one. I'm still excited to talk about it. But philosophy work in business. So um, we mentioned, or you mentioned, Ben, that one of the things we're really aiming to do at ARU, and this has always been part of our training, but now it's much more explicit and focused, is not just learn the material in a scholarly sense, but like we want people to live by the philosophy. The cash value of objectivism is the living of it. And so this course is really practical, that there's going to be kind of theoretical content, but most of it is one of the very striking, unique things about objectivism is that it puts career, productive work at the center of a moral life, and that this is really a key to happiness. And yet many people struggle to figure out, what do I want to do with my life and how do I get there? And as a coach, this is often one of the central struggles of the people that I've worked with, both before I came to ARI and now at ARI, is what do I want to do with my life? Or I'm in a job and I'm not happy with it, or I'm not as successful as I want to be. And I'm going to be um, teaching this course alongside Ankar Gatte and our CEO, Tal Safani. And what we hope to do is really at a very tactical personal level help the students answer those kinds of questions and more broadly be able to use their philosophy as a tool for creating a career that really fills them with joy and allows them to achieve success so don you will be also teaching another course that is called persuasion mastery can you tell us how will this differ from other communication courses that uh, ARI has offered in the past? Yeah, although um, if we're going to switch to that one. I just want to say one other thing about the work philosophy and business course that I neglected sure. to mention. I think one of the really exciting, valuable parts of it is that for most of the classes, we're going to bring in outside guests who have been very successful in their field from all kinds of different fields. People like John Allison, who ran BB&T Banks, hmm. Alex Epstein, who was a former scholar at ARI and now is um, arguably one of the leading, if not the leading energy thinkers on the planet, um, to teach, to educators, to artists, where the students are going to get to hear from them. What is their, what, what is or was their job like on a day-to-day -day basis how did they succeed? What lessons did they learn along the way? And so you're not just going to get the insights that Tal and Ankar and I have to offer, but you're going to get a wide perspective, including a lot of concrete information about different fields to help you think through it. Like these are potential fields that I could go into. And I think that's going to be one of the most exciting um, parts of that course. But now as to the persuasion mastery. So the important thing is, so we have kind of different levels of courses. This is a 300 level course. And it presupposes that you've gone through at least um, Keith Lockich's intro to writing course. And in that sense, um, 
it's really building on that foundation. I'm assuming the kind of essentials of uh, objectivism's way of thinking about communication and persuasive communication. Um, and indeed, if I recall correctly, Keith's course includes going through at least parts of objective communication by Leonard Peikoff, which is available for free, I think, both on U our YouTube site and on the Ayn Rand University app. So that is a master class in and of itself, and I hope people go to that. Um, but this is really um, things that I've learned that kind of build on and go beyond those foundations, including things I've never talked about publicly. But there's also a different respect, or there's another respect in which it's different. Things like the intro writing course and uh, Yaron Brooks speaking course, they're typically focused primarily on the actual acquisition of a skill. We are helping you become better writers. We're helping you become speakers. And certainly there's gonna be a lot of things that are gonna be valuable for building your skills as a persuasive writer and a persuasive speaker. Um, but I think what, uh, what the main focus is, is I want my students to understand what makes things persuasive and not persuasive. That is to get a really deep understanding of why does this change hearts and minds and why does that fail to? And that, that kind of lodestone allows you to be much more in control, not just of, oh, I learned this tactic that seems to work, or somebody told me I need to um, respect my audience contact, but you'll know firsthand and see firsthand, yeah, this is the goal that I'm trying to achieve. And so you'll be able to judge yourself much more effectively, and you'll also be able to judge others because indeed, though i hope many of our students will go on to have careers as persuaders whether as professionals or as a hobby for most um, people who are interested in objectivism the most persuasive thing you can do is promote professional persuaders who are really good that is to recommend resources that actually have a track record of changing hearts and minds and you want to be able to judge that because one thing that you'll see is we tend to kind of let our guard down when we're consuming resources that we agree with. Oh yeah, this, this is, this is fantastic. It tells me exactly why the welfare state is a disaster and should be scrapped. Um, okay. But would that actually change the mind of somebody who hasn't already been convinced? And if you're going around handing out a work that, yeah, it's very good at preaching to the choir, but it's not good at taking somebody who disagrees and turning them into somebody who agrees you're going to be less effective just in your daily life. So even somebody who doesn't want to write or speak uh, successfully, I think will get a lot out of it. But of course, if you want to build a career around it, and, and so in many ways, I mentioned, you know, my job is to coach advanced students. Um, if you think of the coaching program of helping people succeed in their careers as a big focus of it, the, the Persuasion Mastery course is really the best knowledge that I've assembled on how to succeed in a career as an intellectual, at least insofar as we're talking about communication. One final thing I'll say about it from this aspect is um, you had on uh, Harry Binswanger, who um, is just such an incredible resource. I really hope people will take his courses. A lot of what good persuasion really is, is good epistemology. That is the way, one way I think about persuasion is I want to basically share with other people the reasons that persuaded me, but that's only going to be effective if I have very high standards for what persuades me. And Ayn Rand's work, objectivism in general, and a lot of what Harry will be teaching in particular, I think it's going to help you develop those standards, high standards for what persuades you. And I think you'll learn even more epistemology um, from thinking about it, from thinking about these issues from the perspective of persuasion. Uh, I have to say it, it all sounds super exciting. I'm actually, I have signed up for both of these uh, courses that we have been discussing just now. Uh, Don, thank you so much. But before you go, uh, I have one last question. So Mario Len, uh, says in the super chat, um, I'm eager to read the sequel to I Am Justice. So my question is, is there going to be a sequel and when? Uh, uh, there is a draft of the sequel tucked somewhere deep in my uh, metaphorical desk. Basically, once I got hired by ARI, um, I've 
I decided that at least for the first year, uh, which is coming to an end, it gets my full focus and my kind of side, you know, projects, whether it be fiction or other things are going to get set to the side. As I approach the end of the year, I'm can't even imagine taking on any other tasks. I should just say, like, I'm a student in our programs too, whether I audit things or go through them. Um, there's so much content there that I uh, almost feel like it's stolen moments to go and dabble in my side projects. I'll come back to it at some point, uh, but I appreciate the question. I appreciate people um, who enjoyed the book. So there is hope. There is hope. Uh, thank yeah, you, Dom, so much. <laughs> not in the short term, yeah. There's long-term hope. Uh, thank you so much, John, uh, again. Uh, ben, before we wrap up, uh, is there anything that we, any questions that we'd like to take? There were a few questions that came in, uh, people asking just about some logistical questions uh, about the ARU. One person asked, will the lectures be recorded in class if I miss a live class? Definitely, yes. Everything we do is recorded. We have students all over the world and there's there's just no way for us to coordinate our schedule in a way that everybody can show up for a live class and so everything is definitely recorded someone also asked uh, how long the course lasts uh, basically what does the schedule look like and uh, just to let people know uh, we mentioned when dr binswanger's courses start i'll say about how long they run uh, they are the logic class is a two semester, uh, sorry, a two quarter course that runs from April uh, all through June for quarter three and then from July through September uh, for quarter four. I think that the ITUE course is on a similar schedule. I don't have that right in front of me. Uh, the Dostoevsky course that Dr. Milgram is teaching is happening. It's already started. So you've, you've missed one class, um, but that goes through much of the rest of quarter three until May. And then I think this, there's a similar schedule for the philosophy work and business class that is uh, beginning within the next couple of weeks that goes through June. And of course, as Don uh, pointed out, the persuasion mastery course is quarter four, quarter four begins roughly in July, goes through September. Uh, as I said, we're year round, we have year round schooling at the ARU and take off weeks between the quarters. But and not every class is on exactly the same schedule just because of the differing uh, scheduling issues that the instructors have, but they're roughly coinciding with the, that quarter structure. Yeah, and there are breaks uh, because of holidays or just breaks be between the quarters and so on. So it's not like every Friday or every uh, Thursday, etc. Okay, so before we wrap up, uh, we, we have asked one of our students, Francis Elkaron, uh, for a testimonial about his experience, his thoughts on uh, ARU, and we'd like to read it out. Um, for a young, ambitious person, hungry for knowledge, there is no greater pleasure than to work with and learn from minds she respects. For the first time in my life, ARU gave me that experience. After absorbing all I could from Ayn Rand's works on my own, Studying under some of the wor world's foremost objectivists has taken my understanding to the next level in only half a year. ARU is the place to be for those who seek to master Ayn Rand's philosophy for living on Earth. Uh, thank you, for, uh, Francis. Uh, I think it's a nice uh, summary of this uh, episode. we should we should wrap up now by giving our audience the most important action items and the most important of these of course this whole episode has been aimed at recruiting people to register for our quarter three and quarter four courses so again if you are interested in either being a graded student or an auditor the place to go is university.einrand.org apply uh, all of the courses that we've talked about today are open to auditors. Uh, the, some of them are for graded students uh, only. Uh, sorry, that's not, that's not what I meant to say. Uh, some of them are, great, are courses that only certain of our graded students uh, are able to get into because they have uh, prerequisites. That's true, for instance, of the ITUE course, which is a higher level course. 
Um, that hasn't started yet, though. So if you have the prerequisites, you can still sign up for it. The other course, the, uh, the uh, Objective is Logic course, is a 100 level course. That means that you could still sign up to become a graded student if you haven't signed up before to become a graded student. And, and you could take that course uh, starting in a couple of weeks if, if we accept your application. So uh, these courses still, it's still, most of them are start in a couple of weeks and there's still time. So please consider going to university.einrand.org slash apply if you're interested. I should also mention another educational option that's available if, for example, you are relatively new to Ayn Rand's philosophy and you're looking for a way to uh, dip your toes into more of her ideas without going all the way and committing to a full course at the Ayn Rand University. And this is what our reading groups are for. Uh, registration is still open for uh, our latest round of Ayn Rand nonfiction reading groups. These the latest iteration of these just started uh, in March 26th, but usually each of the uh, sessions involves reading just and talking about just one of her essays. So uh, they're self-standing in that way. And that means it's not too late to join. These focus on her nonfiction works like Virtue of Selfishness, Capitalism, the End of an Ideal, Romantic Manifesto, and Philosophy Who Needs It. If you're interested in exploring the ideas behind her fictional works, these are great opportunities for, especially if you're a student or a young adult who's relatively new to her ideas and her nonfiction, you want to explore the philosophy behind these novels. So if you're interested in learning more about these reading groups, you can go to bit.ly slash reading groups 0323. That's for our latest iteration of the reading groups. And uh, we, we've had a really a lot of success with these groups lately. Many of the people who join them end up uh, using that as a stepping stone to go on and then apply for the kinds of ARU courses that we've been talking about today. Let me also share some announcements about uh, upcoming episodes of New Ideal Live. So next week uh, on this program, I believe it's next Friday, April 14th, Augustina Vergara Sid and Nik uh, Nikos Tirkopoulos will be talking about Robert Wright's lies about billionaires. So stay tuned uh, for more on that topic. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please consider subscribing to our channel on YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube, you can click the bell to get notifications for when we go live uh, or post new recordings to that channel. Also, if you're watching the recording, please consider liking, commenting on it, sharing it uh, with other people to help attract new viewers. If you're a current ARU student and you value your educational experience at the Ayn Rand University, that's a great opportunity to share this recording so that other people can find out about what they've been missing. Uh, same thing if you're watching on Facebook, uh, like, share, comment, etc. If you have questions about the Ayn Rand University or about any of the other issues that we talk about on our podcasts, uh, or if you have suggestions for future episodes, topics you'd like us to cover, please send us an email to newideal at einrand.org. We read all of the email that comes in and we reply to most of the emails that come in. I'm currently today working my way through a pile of these emails. And if you haven't gotten an answer to one that you've sent in the last month or so, you're probably gonna get one uh, from me today. So thanks Zimowit for having this discussion with me. Thank you, Ben.